Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We continue in our study of the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. We'll begin reading here in verse 20, down at the end of the chapter. Here again it says, And again the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. And as we finished here at this last statement, this last verse of this chapter, last time. And we want to think upon this here, that we are Christ. We are Christ. We are his heritage. We are his kinsmen. We are his, who he asked to the Father, give me the heathen. And we are that which God the Father gave unto him. We are that which God set aside before the foundation of the world for his name's sake, for the glory of, his, of God and of his Christ, that Christ would come into this world, suffer and die for us, to redeem us from all of our sins. We are Christ. Ye are. I am. All of us who that put our trust in him, who have seen Jesus high and lifted up as our Lord and our Savior, our Christ. Ye are his. Ye are Christ. We are Christ. We're not anyone else's. There are those, as he spoke to them in his ministry, and he said, Ye are of your father, the devil. There are those in this world who are in darkness, who know not who they serve, some even that believe they have seen God. They believe God has come down to them to give them a special message that is not from his word. My friends, God does not speak to us through any other means in these days. In the days of old, the Lord spoke unto them in dreams to lead and guide them. Even before that, God spoke to man audibly and directly. His spirit communed with man directly. But those are the days of old. They're not the days in which we, which we do find ourselves living in now. We find ourselves living in the days that God hath manifested himself and he hath revealed his Son in and through the Word of God. And herein his Word is revealed and manifest unto us and has shown unto us Jesus who was high and lifted up for his people. For that very hour which he came to suffer and die and there to be lifted up and to give up, to yield up his life, a ransom for many, for all the many that would believe and will believe upon him, for the many that are his, for the many that are Christ's, that he has paid our debt and hath redeemed us has justified us, is sanctifying us, setting us apart unto his service, and he will. He will save them all. He'll not lose one of them. They are all his kinsmen, and he is our kinsman redeemer. He is that one who hath come and died in our stead, took upon him our debt, our burden, our grief. He suffered our agony. He suffered our hardships, he suffered our loneliness, he suffered our separation from God the Father, he suffered our hell on the cross. He suffered our judgment. He suffered the justice that should have been dealt to us. We who have transgressed God's word and God's law, and we have sinned against our God, and we continue to do so in the days of our lives. We are Christ. We are Christ's 
kinsmen. We are Christ's reward. We are Christ purchased, redeemed, bought with the price of His precious, shed, holy, righteous blood that was spotless without sin of His own who suffered in our place for all that mighty great sin debt of all his kinsmen whom he came to redeem from their debt from their bondage from their slavery he is Christ he is our Christ he is our Redeemer and there is none else who could fulfill that requirement and stand in that place to be there and to suffer and die to redeem a people unto himself only Christ could do that for us. No other man, no other creature, no other one could stand in that place and fulfill the things and the requirements of the law of God and of God Himself. We are Christ. Christ, who has loved us with everlasting love, He will call and He'll call all of His people unto Him. There's not a one that will not hear his voice. He'll not lose a one of his sheep. Even though he have the ninety and nine, still yet that one that's left out there, he will not leave it. He'll not forget it. But we are Christ. That is the assurance that he will find all of those that are his and he'll bring them in. And then on top of that, we see that Christ is God's. Christ is God's only begotten Son who came, being a part of that Godhead, being part of that Holy Trinity, which has always existed, my friends. There is no beginning with God, and there will be no end with Him. God is... God always was, He always will be. That Father, that Word of God which dwelt with Him, dwelt with him and was with Him before the foundation of the world, and that Holy Spirit, the Father and the Lord, the Holy Spirit, those are their distinctions made in that Old Testament that shows us whether it's speaking of God the Father or the Lord Himself. And it is in and through His Son that God created all things. Christ is that Creator, that part of the Godhead that God says in through Him all these things have been created and brought to pass. In through Him, in through God is that physical life given unto all living things or nothing that was made, that God hath not made, and hath not brought it into existence. It is all God's. God being the author of all creation. God the author of salvation. And there is no salvation apart from our God and His Christ. From that Lord and that Savior. No other means by which men can be saved by the grace of God. We pray that God would help us all to understand these things. How that he has blessed, how that he has made it possible for his people to be redeemed because he hath established it. He hath fulfilled it. Our God, the creator of all things, knowing even before the foundation of the world the things that would come to pass, how that Satan would lead angels in rebellion against him, how that he would deceive Eve, cause her to doubt and question the very word of God, and that Adam would willingly take of that fruit, whatever it may have been, for God doesn't tell us that he was a knowledge of good and evil that was a result of it. He willingly took of that fruit which he knew Eve already had. And I'm sure that he thought in his mind, well, if she's going to die, I'm going to die with her. And they did die spiritually. And they began to die physically. And all the, hit their posterity, all of Adam's uh, descendants began to die in him. 
for we are all less than what those that came before us were. None of us fully knowing understanding these things. Even that little bit which God reveals and shows unto us is just a fragment of what could be known and understood of all the workings of God. How that God foreordained and purpose that He would send His only begotten Son into this world to suffer and live amongst us, fill the heat of the desert, the heat of the day, the cool of the night, without a place of His own. Living for those 30 some odd years, about 33 years, until that hour and that day appointed and that very minutes and times of that day when he would there on that cross suffer and die in our place. God having brought all this stuff to pass for his glory and it will be all in his glory. The redemption of those that are the righteous is to his glory and the judgment of the wicked is to his glory. All there are those that want to find fault with God, that he would cast judgment upon any, all that he would find any lacking and cast them out into hell or out of darkness even. All they want to find fault with God. Our friends, the fault with us. We are the ones who have sinned and transgressed the commandments of God. We have sinned against God, the God of all creation, God who gave us life. Yet we have not been thankful, we have not honored God, we have not acknowledged God. Many yea, have even denied that He is. The day is coming, my friends, when all shall stand before God and His throne, or before His throne, and they shall declare that He is God. They shall bow the knee, and their tongues shall confess Him to be God. Even on the days of their life, they denied His very, his very existence. They shall stand before him and they shall acknowledge God, that he is, and that his Christ is Lord of all, King of kings, his Christ. Moving on, we begin to speak of this chapter 4 now, 1 Corinthians. And we read here and it says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Let those account of us understand, take account, have understanding of this, that whether it be Paul or Apollos or Cephas or Brother Murphy or any of the other men of God that truly are of God who have come now unto you in your life and preached unto you the mysteries of God's Word. The mysteries are not hid anymore. A mystery is something that has been revealed to you. You go to watch a mystery movie, and when it's all over, if you still don't understand, know what was the mystery? Well, who was the culprit? What was it all about? No, it's all revealed. It's all been revealed. In and through God's Word, it's all been revealed unto us. The workings, the plan and purpose of God and salvation. How that He hath brought these things to pass for His glory and His honor. To redeem a people unto Himself for His name's sake to be His people and that He would be their God. That's our purpose of our salvation. And that reward in heaven that we have before us is not to just live however we want, spend our days fishing, spend our days traveling the back roads, spend our days going along life and our own desire and fulfilling our own wishes and our own uh, things we dream of, what we could have done in this life and all we have chance there and all. But that heaven and that life hereafter is for the glory of God. We will live out those days at eternity, future, forever. We will live it out serving God as, as His people. We will live it out growing in understanding of God and seeing His glory and His greatness more fully during all the ages to come. 
we will be his people and he will be our God and there will be no more heartache, sadness, pain, no more death, only joy and happiness and a desire to live for God to be God's people and be to his glory and he will be our God. We will forever be worshiping him and doing his will. Also, so it doesn't sound like heaven to me. Well, it is, and it will be. And to those that don't desire and understand to seek such things, there is a place for you in darkness, suffering, and agony, and not knowing the presence of God any longer. But moreover, he declares that it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. There are requirements for the man of God. For one that would stand before God's people and declare unto them the word of God that they be men of character. Men that are faithful. They're to have a family. Or they should have. We should say this. They should have that example of taking care and providing. Can any of us truly provide all that we might have need of in this life? No. But we can provide the answers that we should seek God and that we should live for God. We should acknowledge God. We should realize that He is God of all creation and that it is God from whom all blessings flow. We acknowledge Him as His ministers, as His stewards ministers to the flock, ministers to his people, servants to his churches, that we might declare unto them the unsearchable riches of God that are set before us and declared unto us. It's required of us as God's men that we be faithful in word and in deed, that we live and do desire to live by the word of God, to abide by it, to keep it as best as God would make us able, and it requires understanding. We must understand what thus saith the Lord. How can a man serve a God whom he hath not heard of, whom he hath not been told? How can he pray unto that God? How can he seek that God lest someone declare him unto him? And how then can that God be declared if they don't go forth and preach it. And how can they then preach that word of God except they be sent? And how can they sent, be sent except they be called? God does save us and he does call us unto the ministry to preach the word of God and to be found faithful therein, setting before you the things of God. You know, I see all these out there in the YouTube and the internet, they have their thousands, some tens of thousands, some hundreds of thousands, some millions of views. Let's say, well, here you have but a few. My friends, if but one person in my lifetime is blessed from this ministry, then it will have fulfilled its purpose. It's not about the numbers, it's not about the notoriety, it's not about fame, it's not about people knowing me all over the world either. But it's about that few, that one if it were just but one, that few if it might be more, that might hear and believe, that might grow in the grace and knowledge of the Word of God and have a closer walk with Him. That's what we desire. That God might cause that chosen few to look to him and be strengthened in faith to walk closer with the Lord to realize that he would have you to be faithful the steward of God the minister is an example before us who stands before us and is to be an example in their life an example in faith an example in understanding being able to set before us the things of God and to teach us what's needed in our days 
to understand that without this knowledge, without the knowledge of the Holy, without that precious knowledge of our Lord and our Savior, all the world has to offer is but dumb. All the wealth of knowledge that the world has that could be set before us that we could grasp and hold on to is worthless, dumb, compared to the precious knowledge of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. It's required of us that we be found faithful. Faithful to the Word of God, upholding it. And my friends, if a man does not believe the Word of God, how can he be found faithful? If he does not sit before you and declare that the Word of God is, and that it is that which you can stand upon and believe upon and live by it, how can he sit, be said to be found faithful? And that troubles me. I see many in my lifetime who have denied the Word of God. They hold, they look at the Bible and say, This contains the Word of God. And if there are parts in it, they'll say, Well, there's some, there are parts in this that are not right. There's error. It's not, it's fallible. It's corrupt. They've allowed themselves to be the mouthpiece of Satan to cast doubt upon the Word of God, for they would, in truth are standing there saying, Yea, hath God said? Hath God really said this? Hath God really said that? Can we trust what is set before us in the Word of God? Can a man be said to be found faithful to God and God's Word if he casts doubt upon the very Word of God itself? I don't think so. I believe in God and this Bible, this holy Word of God which God has given unto us, it is the Word of God. And we do believe in using this King James Bible. It is in doctrine the same as the teaching of the 1611 version. Now, that 1611 version had printing errors. It had no doctrinal errors. But the printing, and there was no standard English in those days. There was no standard spelling of words. And because of that, you look at that original 1611, you'll see three different spellings for son, even. And I'm talking about the Son of God. But the spelling was standardized and corrected. Grammar errors, spelling errors, corrected. No errors doctrinally were ever there. And by 1670 something or so, it was fully prepared, delivered unto the people. And God hath blessed it for these nine unto four hundred years now. God has blessed it. He's honored it as His word. Millions have been saved by the preaching of this Word of God. And we have those now that would strain at a, at a gnat and swallow a camel. Well, it's all that King James has got an error. But they'll go over here and pick up another book that has tenfold and even more of the errors they would say the King James has. My friends, can a man truly be said to be found faithful if he can question and deny the very word of God that is before him as, is this the word of God? It is. And I stand for this word of God. I preach this word of God. I won't, and I'm out of time. Well, not quite. About five more minutes. Looking at my watch wrong. But my friends, the word of God. Satan wants us to doubt the Word of God, and he not only that, he wants us to doubt the man of God who would stand before us. And there are those that want to make us doubt that we can read and understand the things of God. They want to make us think, well, if you can't go back and read that original Greek, and if you can't go back and read that original Hebrew, you're not going to be able to know the Word of God. Well, that's foolishness, my friends. That's foolishness. To think and believe that God had not given us in this English language that preserved 
inspired word of God is foolishness. I say to you that there were not any preachers before this 20th century who dared stand before a Baptist church and preach such foolishness. Oh yeah, there were those outside the Baptist church before the 20th century, but not before the 19th century. Before the 19th century, there were none that would dare question this as the word of God. But we have such learned men in our days, scholars who say, oh, we've looked at the text, we've looked at the manuscripts, and we don't have confidence in this word of God. Yea, is it the word of God? Is what they're saying. Yea, hath God said, can they be said to be men that are found faithful? No, they cannot. If they will dare stand before you as the so-called stewards of God and God's word and cast doubt upon the word of God, they're casting doubt upon God himself. And they're causing doubt in the people of God. When we ought to lift up God, we ought to lift up our Christ, we ought to lift up the Word of God, for Christ is the Word, and declare that it is, and He is, and we ought to believe in the Word of God, and we ought to believe in our Christ, our Savior. We are His stewards. Ye men of God, ye that would stand before the people and cast doubt, you're throwing stones at your Lord and your Savior. You're standing in the place of Satan and say, saying, Yea, hath God said? May God have mercy upon those who would stand before God's people and cast doubt upon God's word. You're doing the work of the devil. You ought not be doing it. For you're not being faithful to God and you're not being faithful to the word of God if you can do such things. If we're to be the stewards of God, we must have faith in our Lord and our Savior, and we must have faith in His Word, which has been delivered unto us, which our forefathers bore in their hands and in their hearts and set it before the people and would not back down from it. Those men of God of old who stood before us and proclaimed unto us the wonderful riches of God's grace. Oh, for their day. But all there is a falling away and a casting of doubt over the word of God. There's a shadow of turning in the hearts of the people of God. And it's starting in the ministers themselves. I remember in the days of my youth being in a Southern Baptist church and those men of God there that began to cast doubt upon the Word of God and question it, question whether or not they had the Word of God and look where they're at now. Ye independent Baptists take heed to these words that at least ye acknowledge God's word and stand firmly upon the foundations that have been given unto us. We too will be in the same place that they are today. A lukewarm people that I do believe that God would rather spit at than to have them at his wedding. Are ye faithful? May God have mercy upon you, my friends, 